Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Giles Whittell. I'm an editor with Tortoise, and this is a thinking on climate change and COVID. Coronavirus has had the moonshot treatment. Does climate change deserve it too? And we're doing this thinking in partnership with BP. And before we started, I just wanted to say something uh, about our, our relationship at Tortoise with our partners, and it very much applies to BP too. Tortoise is, aspires to be a different sort of newsroom that is slow, open, and looking forwards as well as back, or as James Harding, our founder, likes to say, interested in what comes next. Um, and we have a different sort of commercial model too. We don't sell ads. We promise not to sell on your data. Our journalism is funded by our members, but it's also funded, funded by our partners. And what does that mean? It means that they can fund, pay for, tortoise memberships for their employees. They can sponsor Thinkins. Um, they can pay us to host in-house Thinkins for them and produce in-house podcasts for them. And they can also pay us to do website and product development work. We are independent and all that helps us be independent. We have investors too, but none of them has a controlling stake. We're not party political. We are, as we often uh, emphasize at the beginning of Thinkings, open to all points of view. And indeed, one of the main purposes of Thinkings is to, as it were, harvest points of view. But at the end of the day, uh, as we all did in past careers uh, as journalists, we aim to make our own minds up. And as we often remind partners, uh, and we do remind BP, if we ever have to choose between the relationship and the story, we'll, we'll go with the story. Now, I don't imagine for a moment that that ends that particular discussion. Heaven knows how to fund independent media in times like these is a big one. But um, I think for now, I at any rate will uh, try to move on with today's story, which is, I submit, the even bigger one of COVID and climate um, and how humanity's response to the one might have a bearing on humanity's response to the other. Um, most of you, I think many of you will know the drill for a think in. It is based uh, loosely on uh, a newspaper editorial conference. Uh, the whole point is that everyone gets to talk. This is not an old fashioned panel discussion. We do have some great guest speakers, but I'd love to hear from as many people uh, as possible so that we all emerge with a better informed point of view. We say that every time, but it's a great goal, I think, especially with big complex subjects like this. Um, we have the no questions rule. Doesn't mean don't ask a question. It means speak up and there's no need to couch what you want to say as a question. But at the same time, nothing is off limits. Um, if you've got a question, I will permit it. If it's, if it's burning a hole in your, in your brain. Um, how to get involved. Uh, at the bottom of your screens, there is a chat function and my excellent co-editor, Mera P. Mills, is in there with you in the chat mosh pit. Uh, she's waving, hi Mera P. And uh, if you click on the participants button next to that, uh, the list of everybody who's in the room will appear. And at the bottom right hand corner, there is a raise hand button. So let's, let's experiment with that just for a second. Um, let me ask everybody who is broadly optimistic that we might be able to preserve some of what could be construed as a silver lining to uh, the pandemic might be preserved after it. You know, um, particulate and nitrous oxide levels have fallen, so have carbon levels fallen. Who is broadly optimistic, I gotta open my participants list as well, that we can, as some people say, build back better. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing several dozen blue hands. 
uh, at the top of my list. Okay, if you'd like to lower those hands, thank you very much. Uh, who, by contrast, sees any recovery as being a dirty recovery? Okay, I sense a lot of people are on the fence and that's, that's fair enough. I think slightly fewer pessimists than optimists in the room, but um, there's clearly everything to play for. Now I'm hoping uh, that Juliet Davenport is, is here with us. Juliet, did you make it? Yes, can you hear, see me? Excellent, yes, excellent, I did. hi. Hello, yes. how are you Jars? Very well, thank you. Good, um, excellent. Cutting it fine, I suppose. Um, yeah, my Zoom doesn't always behave as it should do, so uh, yeah. I'm afraid it took a little while longer than I hoped well, it's, to get it's, in. It, it's great to have you. Uh, for those people who don't know Juliet, who's been to our thinkings before, or some of them, she is CEO, and I think I'm right in saying founder, yep. of Good Energy. Um, and I have seen it uh, said, Juliet, that um, since the pandemic hit the Western world, uh, governments in developed countries have pledged in all about $5 trillion in, in bail, bailouts, uh, mm -hmm. which is a pretty remarkable, or, or, or economic stimulus packages, a pretty remarkable figure. So, and, and we have all seen that, that governments have acted quickly and really opened the taps financially in, in consequence as a result of imminent threat to human life. Switching over to the, the climate crisis that I know drives a lot of your thinking and, and, and decision making, I suppose one way to sort of condense the whole question is, is what would you do with $5 trillion? <laughs> okay, so I mean, I think, I think when we look at what, how we could reboost this, I think one of the things we can look at is where, where, have we, where, where may we have actually got ourselves into this hole and how do we not prevent ourselves come, getting into another hole in the future? So my view is twofold, is that I think our economies have been um, very, uh, not very resilient to this particular shock. Um, in addition to that, there's also the longer term climate shock that is coming along as well. So I think we can potentially answer both of those. And I think we need to look um, both as a country, but also as part of a sort of worldwide effort. And part of that is really considering where have we spent our innovation and research money over the last 20 years and where should we spend it in the future? And that is a fundamental underpin of where we see innovation coming through in economies. And uh, today, if you look at the spend, particularly in the UK, um, we've seen a lot focused on aviation, we've seen a lot focused in the automobile industry, but not so much in new thinking and new ideas in technology and innovation. So first of all, I would spend the money there, I would shift it into looking at the new solutions, fast tracking a lot of them, seeing whether they're real or not. There's a, there's a lot in the forward forecast we're seeing at the moment for zero carbon. We really don't know whether they'll work yet. So we need to understand more about that. The second part is looking at infrastructure. So one of the things about that COVID has really brought to us is it breaks, gives us a, a firm break with, with what happened before. And that is one of being the biggest problem in climate change. If you arrived on this planet, with a climate change problem already there, but none of the businesses, none of the infrastructure, none of the vested interest and the investments already there, it would be a lot easier to change. And one of our biggest challenges has always been the people have got investments in the old world. So how do we break that apart? And that is, that's really important, particularly in terms of the existing infrastructure, where are gas pipelines, where are electricity cables, and how, what do they look like in a future world that is low carbon? Looking at the markets, the markets were all built around high carbon, large power station approaches. So again, I think we need to reconsider. I put a blog out recently about something called the capacity market. This is a marketplace that has really disrupted new low carbon technology. So I would take that away. 
Um, and then we look at customer and making sure that consumers are part of this. They don't get excluded. They don't get missold. And so whether you need to spend that much money on doing that, Giles, I'm not sure. I just think you need to spend a lot of money on um, getting people to that place, bringing people together. And one of the biggest challenges, I think, and I think this is something that organizations like BP need to think really hard about, is they organizations that have split loyalties between the future and the past are, are very difficult bedfellows to think about a new system. And when you want to change a system, if you've got a vested interest in the old system, it makes it very hard as an organization. And we've seen a lot of businesses split where they've sold off all their old fossil assets and become renewable companies. And that gives them a much clearer remit to go forward. And I think that is a big challenge, is how do you get rid of a lot of those assets on the balance sheet? And I would probably spend a lot of that money writing off those assets, leaving fossils in the ground, um, and allowing some of these big companies to get on and embrace this new world rather than being stuck in the old one. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Spencer, are you there? I am here. I've just, I've just been unmuted by my host, which I assume is you, Joel, so thank you. No, I, I wouldn't know how to unmute anybody, but thank you. Right, for those who haven't met uh, Spencer before, uh, Spencer is Group Chief Economist and VP, and before that you were Head of Stability uh, at the Bank of England. And um, I mean, in a sense, I would just throw to you what, um, what Juliet has just been saying, but I'd just like to add also, since it, it, it she does sort of um, uh, tackle the issue head on of companies like yours with a foot in the, in, in the uh, past as well as potentially in the present. The question that many people always ask about the investment mix, how long do you honestly think that we all have to, to wait for the sector, the fossil fuel sector, the investment mix as between oil and gas and renewables to move from roughly 95% to the opposite, to 595. Um, but there was a lot that Juliet was also asking. And, and if, if you can address all that, that would be great. Um, I can address all of that. Um, how long w will it take? Well, hopefully it won't take the world much longer than 30 years. Um, if we're going to be consistent with achieving a, a one and a half degree temperature target, uh, uh, temperature target, the world will need to essentially decarbonize by 2050. And, and at that, by that point, the amount of unabated oil, gas and coal that the world consumes will need to be pretty close to zero, if not zero. And so I hope um, that that it will happen within um, 30 years. If we're on a two degree target, it may take a little bit longer than that, but that's the sort of time period um, we, are, we are talking ab about. And so I think it's, it's that sort of time frame. Um, uh, what would I do with all those trillions of dollars? Um, I, I think what I would be, I mean, a lot of those trillions of dollars are going into essentially disaster relief at the moment. They're trying to keep businesses uh, afloat, which are viable businesses, which could otherwise go bust. They're trying to keep people who have lost their jobs, providing them income. And so in that sense, a lot of that is just pure uh, in, in emergency disaster. And I don't think we should just pull that away. I think in terms of the future and where I think the big potential risks and opportunities is how the world responds to the impact of COVID on the developing world. If you think about um, developing Asia, outside of China, Africa, some parts of Latin America, looking ahead the next 30 years, all of the growth in energy demand over the next 30 years will come from those regions. Those regions have the most vulnerable economies and are likely to be most severely impacted by COVID. What does the West do in response to that? If the West sits by and just worries about itself and worries about um, greening its own um, backyard and leaves those economies um, either um, to, to stagnate or even worse for others to fill that hole who don't care as much about green energy, then I think we are, 
we are potentially missing an enormous opportunity. There's enormous opportunity here if you go and, and spend a lot of those uh, development, that money in those developing economies to actually leapfrog some existing technologies and allow those economies both to recover, but to recover in a green way. And I, and I must admit, I'm slightly nervous about the enormous energy in, in terms of Build Back Better that we hear about at the moment, but much of that energy about Build Back Better is how to build back rich economies better. And I'm hearing far less energy and, and sort of just column inches and dollars talking about how to build back developing economies better. And that's, that seems to me something I, I think is quite important when we're looking about what really is going to shift the dial in terms of achieving net zero by 2050 over the next 20 or 30 years. Well, let me just ask you in terms, in practical terms, that leapfrog, which is an extremely seductive vision. We've seen it on a small scale with mobile telephony in the developing world. Uh, what are the technologies and, um, and, and can you just address Juliet's point about um, the challenge to the oil and gas sector of leaving assets in the ground and switching to those new technologies? Are you up to it? Um, I, I, I certainly hope so. We are certainly committed to doing it. I, this is not... And I see lots of the chat rooms about why on earth is BP here and what role does BP have? And, and the simple answer to that, and I, I know people just roll their eyes, the simple answer is so we can learn. Uh, so we can engage in conversations like this and so we can have and learn more about uh, these issues and, and hear people's different points of view. Our, our ambition, we've been very clear about this, our ambition is to be a net zero company by 2050. What that means is the carbon emissions associated with the oil and gas that we produce by 2050 will be net zero. That means either we capture the carbon emissions from that oil and gas, we offset it with natural carbon solutions, or we don't produce it. Okay, if every single company in the world committed to net zero, every oil and gas company committed to net zero, the world would be at net zero. Done, period, stop. It doesn't matter what, what happens to power stations, doesn't matter what happens to uh, aviation, doesn't matter how, what happens to cars, the world will be at net zero. That's what we're trying to do. Um, we're going to try and do that by 2050 or sooner. Uh, will we be able to do it? Well, we certainly think so. That's why we're committed to doing it. Uh, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. So are we up for it? Yes, we are. Will we be successful in doing it? Well, I don't know. We're going to have to have a good go at doing it. And conversations like this help us understand different people's um, point of view. I guess the only point to Juliet here, the world has vested interest in both here, Juliet. I mean, the world today is still consuming huge, huge amounts of oil and huge amounts of gas. And we just turned it all off tomorrow clearly that would not be great for the world and it would lead to huge human devastation and so we need to find a way of turning it off as quickly as we possibly can in a, an economically efficient way as we possibly can to ensure that we can take that money and fund it into other things and finding that way is not difficult it, it's not easy it's incredibly difficult but it, it, it's not just come it's not just oil companies have vested interest in oil and gas all of us will be consuming, uh, or vast majority, and many of us will be consuming oil and gas today uh, in one form or, or another. Uh, and so the world has that vested interest. And we need to find the, the efficient way of doing that to do it as quickly as possible, consistent with that 2050 type target. Uh, thanks, Spencer. I noticed Chris in the, in the chat, and I haven't been able to keep up because there's a heck of a lot of it, is saying uh, CCUS, carbon capture and storage is entirely unproven at scale. And this is an issue that uh, comes up a lot, uh, not least because uh, much of the uh, oil and gas sector uh, future modeling uh, depends on it, hence the term uh, the distinction between abated and unabated carbon. Um, and it's one of the things that we actually are trying to drill down into in a Moonshot 2030 project that uh, I'm doing with some wonderful Tortoise members and, and volunteers to try and figure out how to get to net zero, not by 2050, but by 2030, hence the moonshot uh, phrase. But um, in the course of this, I'm constantly discussing with the people that we're doing it with, where are the real world examples of um, changes in uh, business practices, but also governance that, that are making a difference. And I'm delighted to say that we have with us someone who is possibly responsible for one of those, but we're going to find out a bit more about it. So Jane, Jane Davidson, uh, whose book Future Gen is published today, congratulations, um, was uh, a Minister for Sustainability and Housing in Wales and was also in 2015 the author 
of, let me get this right. The, um, don't, no, no, don't, I, I, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. The, the, the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act, um, which perhaps I should let you summarize it, but it basically enshrines in law a requirement on all Welsh legislators to think about the future, think about their children um, uh, before doing anything. Now, this was in, in 2015. Jane, uh, is this something that we can enshrine in our 2030 Moonshot project? Is it working? Um, well, I, I, I think that um, the, the opportunity, uh, hopefully, for people to have a look at my book, which um, has over 140 contributors, will mean that people can make up their own mind about how well it's working in Wales. But I, what, has, what has been absolutely fascinating is the, the increase in interest um, in a systemic model of governance that has values at its heart. I mean, I think what has been really interesting to me in the discussion so far between um, Spencer and, 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 and Juliet is that we have not actually at the beginning of this programme, particularly in the context of um, the, the debate I've been watching on the chat about, uh, about sponsorship, we've not actually thought of what are the values that we need in the context of ensuring uh, future generations um, have a better life, if possible, than the one we have. Because surely, you know, as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, as brothers and sisters, we would all want to deliver on, on John Rawls's proposition, which is do unto future generations what you would have had past generations do unto you. And I think what has been brave about the Wales experiment is the idea that a government was prepared to um, not only define what that value system is, which includes in law a definition around innovative low carbon prosperity, so does not allow the expansion of fossil fuels within the Welsh government's um, uh, uh, levels of authority, um, but that actually members of, of um, multi-party membership in the assembly decided to sign up to that, that they wanted to be perceived as a country looking after the interests of future generations. And I think what's really important about that is actually looking after the interests of future generations is countercultural. I mean, with apologies to Spencer, um, net, net, net zero by 2050, um, I would hate it if my, my future generations had to live with that as the best ambition we could possibly have at the moment. I mean, a paper came out from the Tyndall Centre on Climate Change from Professor Kevin Anderson and others from Manchester University yesterday saying that, you know, net, we've got, we don't know how we're going to meet the net, so we should just be looking at zero. And if we're going to deliver on Paris, uh, the UK has to achieve 100% um, uh, uh, the loss of fossil fuels in its system by 2035. 80% um, by 2030. And yet when I did a bit of research for this, and, and I only use BP as an example because it's a sponsorship, it could have been any of the oil companies. You know, BP opened Clare Ridge in 2018, 640 million barrels, quarter of a billion tons of carbon. And when we look at the fact that Client Earth um, uh, challenged BP on its adver advertising campaign, possibilities everywhere, that had to come down because it suggested that BP was a renewable company, when in fact, I can't actually get the exact figure, but um, I'm hearing somewhere between 96% and 95% fossil fuel and 5% renewable. And I think the, the parallel with COVID at the moment is that we really need some very simple and clear solutions. So if one of those solutions was to say that by 2030, there would be no more use of fossil fuels in the UK, then actually that is something people could work towards. And what the Build Back Better campaign from COVID has shown so clearly is there is so much imagination out there that can contribute to it. But at the moment, we are still shifting the mitigation burden to, poor, uh, to, to future generations. And of course, those future generations in COVID are already potentially poorer. 
they have less access to housing, they're paying off university debts, they don't have a say in the policies about them. And I think that what's really important in terms of actually taking some heart from COVID, and I'm a fence sitter until we see how we go on this, but taking some heart from COVID is emissions have gone down, but they've not disappeared. They're still actually going up. And of course, the more emissions that come in, the more action needs to be taken. So when I'm sitting in a, in a proverbial room with an organisation that is putting in quarter of, of a billion tonnes of carbon, I'm really asking the question about how that's going to affect my children and my children's children and those yet to come. And I think the value of the, the Welsh approach is that although it may be a, a regional government in in UK terms, people are looking at it all over the world at the moment as a way of framing the argument. And I think we have to frame the argument. What do we want to address? Surely we want to address the level of inequality. And COVID is exposing different kinds of inequalities. It's exposing inequalities um, in the black, black and minority ethnic communities, and it's exposing uh, inequalities in the context of poverty. But we're also seeing other inequalities that are continuing to be ramped up in the context of climate change. And we know that climate change's overall impact will be far greater than COVID. So I'm a kind of like first principles person. And I just think that we ought to be transparent. We ought to be honest. We should not be hypocritical because we know what we're doing is wrong. So we have advertising campaigns that pretend we're doing something else. Um, and that we should actually sit down with the best minds in the country and say, what is the earliest we can take fossil fuels out of the mix? Germany announced today that it will not um, allow cars using diesel or petrol to be incentivized in, the, in its COVID um, uh, uh, rehabilitation and I think we've got to have a strong government lead that actually drives fossil fuels out of our economy because they are the biggest impact on climate change. Thank you Jane, thanks very much. A great ap appeal to honesty. Uh, on the one hand we've got to be honest haven't we that uh, a lot of us perhaps for want of proper affordable choices are still customers of the fossil fuel sector and another thing on which I think we need to be honest is that um, uh, COVID has elicited rapid, deep-pocketed responses because of imminent threat to life. And I sometimes find myself wondering, do people have to start dying in the tens of thousands for us to start, for, for governments to start taking uh, climate change really seriously? Um, with that uh, uplifting thought, let, let's try going to Stuart Murray, who's, who's had his hand up. Uh, what's on your mind, Stuart? Sorry, I didn't know I had my hand up. So oh, uh, I haven't really got okay. anything to add at the moment. Uh, oh, well, not to worry. Uh, uh, ben, uh, did you mean to have your hand up? Ben Cropper. Hello, yeah, I did mean to have my hand up. Ben, hi, um, what's on your mind? Um, I just wanted to ask, um, my brother, worked for an oil company in the field of venture capitalism as a project manager uh, to reinvest money into the electric car sector. But I always had a real cynical view of that, that the only reason they were employing people like him was to uh, change the perception of oil companies for their wrongdoing in the past. So um, what can BP or other oil companies or any of the experts here today tell me to reassure me that it's not purely for fi financial gain and there is actually some uh, future generation element to it? Uh, th that's a really good question. And so let me, let me pass that uh, uh, to Spencer. I, 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 uh, I, I don't want to dilute it or, or, or I just want to put my own spin on it. I was thinking about this, um, uh, b beforehand, uh, Jane has made the case and actually taken action for to introduce new metrics by which governments measure success or, or um, decide what they do. Uh, is there any possibility that uh, your sector in particular can um, 
ob start observing new metrics apart from bottom line about its own success? Yes, I think I think so. I think in a number of ways. I mean, I think many people will know about uh, TCFD, which is the Task Force for Transparency on, on Climate uh, ex um, Climate Risk, which is essentially what that does is trying to increase transparency about companies' resilience to climate risk. I think one could go step one step further, where I think there's an enormous amount of energy going into um, ESG type um, uh, indexes, which will will measure the good that, that companies are doing, or if you like, the bad uh, they are doing relative to just profits. And I think increasingly investment is being fund it would be is it being affected by those ESG metrics. So I think I, I, I picking up one of the points that Jane made. I think one thing that COVID is doing, I think for the good is redefining, if you like, social, the social contract with, with companies. The idea that companies only exist to make money it clearly just is, is nonsense. And, and I think COVID has shown that it's nonsense in the sense that companies have a wider commitment to support the communities in which um, they work. Um, in terms of Ben, Ben, how can I convince you that um, this is not just sort of greenwashing? Well, I have children. Uh, and I don't go, I haven't got horns growing out of my head. I, 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 I have to look in the mirror at night and think, am I doing net good for the world or not? Um, and it may be, you think, well, he just cares about money. The, the idea that, that, that all these huge number of scientists that people employ, engineers that these people employ, they're all just bad people that care only about money. And they're just this is completely different breed of people. It just seems, I, I don't think is right. And well, in fact, I know it's not um, right. So. We care about this as well. We, you want to get up in the morning. You want to get up in the morning and, and think you're doing something which has a net benefit for the world. Um, as Giles said, I spent 25 years working in the public sector, uh, which I hope was doing net benefit the world. And I think I'm doing as much, if not more, net benefit for the world in trying to help BP shift its whole business model to one which will be a net zero um, business model. But ultimately, you won't believe what I just said. Many people on this call won't believe words. They will want to have actions. And so I think when we come to set out our objectives, just saying, wait till 2050 and see if we get there won't be enough. We will need to set clear guy posts and sign posts and say, we will achieve, try to achieve this by 2030. We're trying to achieve that by 2035. And you can hold us to account and hold us to account and see if we're actually moving along the pathway we're saying we're committed to moving along the pathway. We are committed to that pathway, um, but um, we, the, the onus is on us to be transparent, explain what we think that will look like in terms of clear um, the flat points in, in time, and then you should hold us to account. Thanks, uh, Spencer. Jason's pointing out in the chat, uh, just going back a little over a bit of uh, BP history, that um, uh, Lord Brown uh, said great things about net zero. I d did he actually talk about net zero in, in terms of beyond petroleum? But um, uh, I, I wanted to ask in that connection, um, whether in contrast to the um, first mover advantage, that I believe is something you learn about at Harvard Business School, there is a terror, a fear in the oil and gas sector now precisely because of the beyond petroleum disaster um, that uh, uh, a sort of a first mover disadvantage. If you, if you as an oil and gas company try to go out ahead of your um, uh, uh, rivals in terms of commitments on carbon emissions, that it'll, it'll end up biting you in the rear end commercially. Is that a big factor? I think it's less getting out in front of your rivals, it's getting out in front of society. If, society, if you then say, I'm going to commit to spend billions and billions and billions of dollars producing low carbon energy, uh, which we did, and then you find that the, the carbon price which is needed to sell those, uh, uh, that energy isn't there, then you make lots and lots of losses. And that's what we did. Um, so in essence, a simple way of thinking about it, a lot of the businesses that we invested in assumed that within 10 years, the carbon price would get to about $40. Clearly, come on, of course it's got to get to about $40. Climate science is real and $40 is only starting the process in terms of getting carbon prices up. It's very hard to find anywhere in the world today, even today, where carbon prices are $40. So guess what? We invested huge sums of money and lost lots of money. 
And so um, I think what the Beyond Petroleum thing does means you can try and lead, but you can't drag the whole world with you. And if the world is not there yet, they ready to buy clean energy, then you can't sell that energy and you lost, you will lose lots and lots of money. And we were part. Uh, and we're, you know, the Beyond Petroleum is quite a good example of that. And that's why, in terms of the aims that we've set out in terms of BP, and I don't want those to be about BP, this is about COVID and climate change, but BP today accounts for around 1% of the world's carbon emissions, if you look at the, the, the carbon emissions that we're responsible for. So what happens to BP sort of matters, but it's 1%. We need to get down 100%. Okay, but what we can do, we're a big voice. And we're a big player. And so half our objectives are getting, making sure that we get to net zero. The other half is helping the world get to net zero. So we can do that by advocacy. We can do that by transparency. It can be, we can do that by changing trade associations. And we've been very explicit about all those things. So I think hold us to account both on what we do ourselves as a company. But I, for me personally, I think even more important is what we do to help the world get to net zero, leverage our position to have to punch above our weight in terms of trying to get the rest of the world along. Because it's only if the rest of the world comes along and um, will, will other companies and us be successful in trying to change the types of fuels and energies that we sell. Uh, thanks, Spencer. Uh, uh, Bayriam, if I'm pronouncing your first name correctly, forgive me if I'm not. You pointed out interestingly in the chat that uh, people are already dying as a result of climate change and, and, and you, you've raised your hand. What are your feelings about um, what we might preserve that is good after COVID? So I just want to say that I'm part of the Generation Z. So most of the time when we talk about uh, climate change and the climate crisis, we usually think that I'm fighting for my future, but I'm not fighting for my future. I've, I'm fighting for, for a lot of people's uh, daily lives that are experiencing the effect of the climate crisis in the global uh, south right now. So I don't want to frame it on my future. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to frame it on the presence of, of a lot of people who are dying. And especially when we look at COVID-19 right now, uh, we can see that uh, black and brown communities are dying on a higher rate much more uh, than uh, white people again so uh, the whole frame of this discussion is a bit uncomfortable for me in a way because i don't want to use this as a learning experience uh when we need actions uh mm -hmm. and we need actions right now and we when we look at how bp have been uh guilty of environmental racism and when we look at the bp uh deep horizon uh spill and the link to the Iraq, uh, Iraq war invasion and the BP lobbying of the UK government of that. I wanna know what kind of environmental justice planning will be implemented in our goals to net zero in the future. Well, what environmental justice uh, uh, requirements would you like to see? Uh, or, uh, or, or perhaps if you've had a chance to look at the, at the one trillion euro uh, European green plan. For, uh, uh, is there anything there that, um, that strikes you as, as, as a template for, for the UK or, 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 the, or the, the world more broadly? Um, first of all, I would like to, for our government and all governments in the Western world to stop allowing uh, oil companies to be part of lobbying uh, of their uh, future policies, because I feel like this is affecting tons of our our response to the global south right now mm -hmm. and uh, we are letting people die and uh, secondly i would like to see a huge and big uh, conversation about uh, climate refugees and what this mm -hmm. will mean and this is happening right now and we, when we are uh, when we have in our museums uh, looted objects and we are not allowing them to go to, to go back to their communities when we are having borders that stop people who are the descendants of the people whose uh, who's these objects were part of, I feel very uncomfortable. So this is two things, but there is a lot of different ways we can engage in this conversation. Thank you. Can I just ask, um, you say in a sense that you're, you want to be speaking for the Global South. Are you from the Global South? I am. Uh, I'm, I don't want to speak on behalf of the Global South at all. Oh, I'm sorry. Turkish uh, and this doesn't have to be the global south in a way so and i don't want to speak on behalf of 
the global south. I'm speaking on my personal level. Understood. Personal thank, thank you. Uh, um, uh, Juliet's got her hand up, but first, can we go to James, who's at the top of my queue? James Ingram. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I think the problem is that we're, with, if, if we narrow it just to BP, I don't, I don't agree with a lot of what BP's done in its history, but, um, you know, we're not even talking about the large part of the energy market, which is Saudi Aramco, Gazprom, state-owned companies in South America, which dominate the market, and we're not even discussing that um and without those kind of companies reforming we we don't really have a chance so um yeah i think i think that needs to be considered in terms of um coronavirus and the links um i made in the chat but the, the opportunity is regards to the infrastructure building that can be done um post post in the recovery obviously every economy will need to develop and that gives us a chance to build green uh, infrastructure but that doesn't, again, really affect the fundamental structural problem around carbon price. Um, you know, the fact that a flight is so cheap. Um, and I think we just, we, if we try and individualize action, um, we won't go anywhere. And that's, and that's shown by how the fact that all, as a collective of human beings, we've all locked down. We've all done this <laughs> incredible sacrifice, um, not traveled, you know, whatever. And still 83% of emissions remain. Um, so I think that just that that should be the lesson that um, you know, regardless of what we do as individuals, and and I I applaud people who who drive less, who 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 take a vegan diet, etc. Ultimately, it, there there are big structural problems that we have to address, uh, and a carbon tax is is I believe what is is needed, um, and this is talked about by experts. Um, Dieter Helm at yeah. the University of Oxford is someone that's worth looking at on this. Um, he explains it, it quite succinctly, which is, yeah, as you say, without those incentives and real price of carbon, we'll still be making these poor decisions in the future. Thank you. Yes. And I noticed that um, uh, air pollution is back up above pre-COVID level, levels in, in Beijing. Uh, Juliet, I promised we'd come to you uh, and, and then we'll go to uh, Clarissa and then Jane. So, so I was just going to respond to a couple of pieces um, that are really interesting and that come through in here. Um, first of all, in terms of the points I was making earlier, the, the influence on government is incredibly important in this. This is the point I was talking about, about infrastructure. Um, we have just approved one of the largest gas power stations in Europe, in the UK, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we, it's just gone through a, another appeal case. Um, and by building that in, you're going to have that in place that's going to be trying to get a return on investment for the next 30 years. And we need to start making decisions today that stop that. Mm. And one of the ways of doing that and, and will impact on a lot of fossil companies. And in fact, I've been con spoken to a couple of times by people like Moody's. The credit ratings of these very large companies and the way that they can raise debt and the commitments of banks not to lend debt into these organizations is a really important part of this puzzle. Um, and making sure that the risks that um, companies are running related to the planet is included in their credit rating, I think is a really interesting way forward. Mm -hmm. Um, th there's also another part that's going on at the moment. So I'm part of something called the Future of Corporation, which looks at including purpose in the articles of association of a company. And, and interesting, actually, the company secretary of BP, I think, is on that committee. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if BP showed the leadership to include the um, targets that you have in your articles of association? Because at that point, everything is being held to account on the same basis. And you don't have to have us holding you to account. You can have your shareholders um, and everybody else. So I think, I think there are mechanisms that we can see a new way forward. And, and actually, this is the opportunity, I think, for a lot of these organizations to cut the way they've always done things. And that, that's, that's definitely, I think, what we're seeing from a consumer point of view um, is to people are reflecting now that they don't necessarily want a life that they had pre-COVID. So you see, the, I think the RSA did a piece of work that only 9% want to return to that pre-COVID world. Um, and so this is an opportunity that it feels like there is a general consensus that climate change and clean air um, community is a really important part of our society going forwards. And therefore it is an opportunity to push that through. 
Uh, Julia, uh, from those conversations you've been having about uh, whether climate risk can be included in, exposure to climate risk can be included in credit ratings, might it actually happen? I think, I think we're beginning to see it. And I definitely, um, the, the interest of a lot of credit agencies of the um, climate change um, negotiations, what's happening there, what commitments are going to be making. And also the, I mean, you're beginning to see some of the larger banks make commitments that they will not put debt because uh, divestment is part of it but equity is only a small part of what is actually needed to develop projects so there's maybe up to 80 percent of projects are funded through debt the debt markets and i think it's going to be the debt markets that really dictate how fossil is continues to be embedded in our systems right thank you i mean because there are a lot of writers on this including kingsmill bond who had something out today um uh, who have been forecasting for a while that debt will um, credit will become too expensive for the oil and gas sector but um, I, I worry that that may be a bit premature um, yeah maybe that he may be wrong in is what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know enough about how the markets work but Clarissa you've had your hand up very um, patiently what's on your mind okay so um, my question and comment so I'm actually in a very strange difficult position because I I'm still a BP employee, but I took time away from that to go back to study. And the main reason is I wanted to move towards getting the company in a better place in Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm also from a developing country. So I think my position is my country depends so much on oil and gas and hydrocarbons. But what do I do as a young person to help them move forward? because it's not going to be an easy change. And I don't think people understand how it's difficult for a country that is solely dependent on one thing to move away from that. So that's kind of my mindset. And now I'm in a place that is completely different from my country. So I'm in South Korea studying and I've seen how it is to live in a polluted place. So the norm, they are custom wearing masks because of the, the level of fine dust, which is really difficult to see. And then I saw it clear up like almost instantly when COVID happened. But there was a dual effect when everyone decided to stop using public transportation because of the fear of the virus. So where an economy and a country that's really dependent on people getting to work, um, using public transportation, using cheap um, clean forms of transportation all of a sudden had to switch back to using individual cars or trying to walk some places. So my question is what what would a developing country do and how do we support developing countries because it's not as easy as everyone is saying right now mm -hmm. in the chat. Mm. That's completely fascinating and I'll put that question to, to Jane uh, who's had her hand up in, in, in a second. But let me just ask Clarissa, in South Korea, as everyone's got in their cars and air pollution has spiked again, um, is there any sense of, re of regret? Obviously, because the country is more of a, I guess, a forward-thinking country. So I think they want to use the buses, they want to use their public transportation, they have like e-scooters everywhere, even though their infrastructure, their roads aren't as good, their sidewalks aren't as good, you still see people using these things. And they have a sense of um, pride in that they are a very uh, forward thinking country, but they also are very fearful because they, they worry about their population's health. So they had to choose between uh, being clean in terms of energy or survival of their elderly population etc right so uh, a, a brutal choice between long and short term in, in a sense um uh, jane clarissa was asking how do we support um governments in developing countries and your book is lessons from a small country not a developing one but i suppose we're all trying to develop in a way what would your answer be I think I think one of the things that um, uh, the COVID experience um, across the world has really highlighted is some of the things that we thought were important before the COVID crisis turn out to be a lot less important after it. And we've seen that actually 
um, although we've been told for many years that it's certain categories of people and financiers that keep our economy and um, the agency of government alive, what we find is that actually if you get a short, sharp shock, we see that actually it's the people um, who are almost at the bottom of the economy that have kept us alive. It's the people who have looked after our health. It's the people who have um, carried on uh, distributing goods. Um, it is the people who've looked after our uh, environment locally, by, often in a voluntary way. Um, and I think that, that if we there are things that we should really try and hold on to from COVID. And I think what Clarissa does uh, articulate so very well is that notion that if you start thinking in a different value system, then actually when you return to the previous one, you realize that effectively you've made choices previously that have led you to this situation. And now you could make other choices. And I think when you asked the, 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 the question, Giles, at the beginning about, um, you know, were people optimistic or pessimistic? Um, I'm a natural optimist in the sense that, um, and I believe that my natural optimism has been um, repaid um, a thousandfold in the context of the, um, uh, of the pandemic, because everywhere we've seen these wonderful random kindnesses of people to each other. Uh, but actually what the systems have not done is caught up with the idea that values have now changed. And mm -hmm. if we go back to the original Kyoto Agreement, of course, you know, that was looking very much at the role that the developed countries played and the role of developing countries. And I think that, um, you know, we, that's, that's replicated to a much smaller extent in the Paris Agreement. But when I advocate um, in, term of, in terms of keeping fossil fuels in the ground, I was advocating for the UK. I mean, I'd love to have it done elsewhere, but I think the, I mean, the UK economy could make a very deliberate move as a result of COVID um, over the next decade. And to be honest, anything longer than a decade is not in government thinking. It's a way of shifting the burden onto future generations. And the small, and it's not, it's a big message from a small country is that although there'll be plenty of people that say the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is still in very early stages, but, and, and that it's not delivering as everybody might want it. But of course, what it has done is it set a government framework, which means that actions that are contradictory to that framework can challenge public services and government. And that's what's attractive to other countries as well. And I know that I've, I've been in conversations um, with people from South Korea and others, with Vietnam, with, um, you know, with Canada, Australia, Iceland, Scotland, uh, New Zealand, all sorts of countries who are very interested in the idea that maybe short-termism has gone too far and the belief that the only way in which countries can um, be prosperous is to allow free reign to a private sector, irrespective of what they do. And I just would go back to um, Professor Donatella Meadows, who um, systems thinker, one of the first people back in 1972, who drew people's attention to the fact that the, the world was overshooting finite resources. Um, sadly dead now, I think one of the most extraordinary systems thinkers of her generation. But she actually posits three models for the world. And in the first, in the first model, the world is extracted. It extracts everything it can and the model is collapsed. In the second model, the world it extracts. And although people are conscious that there is a cost to that extraction, they all still try and extract as much as possible before any agency or government steps in to, um, to, in a sense, put that cost in place. And that's the situation we're in now. But that way also lies collapse. And I have to, as an optimist, believe that there is, there is enough science, there's enough commi commitment, there's enough um, uh, support for the context that actually actions we take today, and that's why I quote, quoted um, Claire Ridge and quarter of a billion tons of carbon coming in and therefore support what Julian uh, was saying as well about the new um, power station. 
if we keep putting these things in now, we have locked in emission increases mm -hmm. for the lifetime of the next generation. So in fact, since we've known about it since 1972, we should be really using COVID as a way of saying, okay, we're not going to make those binary choices anymore, but we're gonna try and make choices that look after the health of the population, our environment, um, the economics, uh, in terms of having prosperity that actually benefits a wider number of people. We're going to be globally responsible. Um, and all those aspects are in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It's not a single issue. It's not just a discussion about oil right. or carbon emissions. It's a discussion about how we tackle those other aspects that affect our health, how we can um, look positively in the context of inequality. So I Thank think you. actually a paradigm about future generations just helps us on, 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 onto that thought process. Thank you. I want to hear from uh, uh, some more people briefly before we run out of time, uh, but I, I do also want to give Spencer a chance, uh, not now, but when I've heard from Bruce and Alison, and if we have time, Albie, to answer Chris Garrard's question in, in the chat. Why is it the case that BP and others are in a position to make an argument that they couldn't pursue renewables at scale until the price was viable, rather than when it was viable in terms of what the climate science demands? I think that's a good question. But uh, Bruce, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, hi, like, like the beard. Hi there. Huh? Yes, so, you know, lot there. Um, yeah, so I guess it was, it was two points really around this COVID as an opportunity um, out of the crisis. Um, the first one being that I think there's plenty of good evidence now and policymakers seem to be listening to it that, that the, the, part, the green stimulus path is the most effective way of um, doing two things. Firstly, um, you know, addressing this collapse in potential collapse in um, productive capacity that we have and not doing that in a way that, as others have said, bakes in um, uh, carbon into our system again. Um, and I think, you know, we're looking at that in terms of working with the public sector to raise that money as potentially the fastest actors against that stimulus. Um, and then on, on the other side, I think it's, it's, it's really, really a question of, um, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm more skeptical that BP needs to make the moral case to exist. I think it needs to make the market case to exist to the point around credit risk. And I think we should actually really be asking the question of the credit rating agencies who 10, 12 years ago didn't cover themselves in glory in terms of their ability to predict right. the future, um, whether they really are showing that credit risk. Um, and I think that, that you know, it's on the finance side of things that a lot of this change might actually be brought about rather than a debate about the morality of someone other, someone's business model. Um, so I think it, it's, it's more around that. You say, well, the finance system has a role to play here and it doesn't get enough stick actually at the moment for the role that it is playing in propping up business models that may well be past their sell-by date. Thank you, Bruce. Um, following up as, uh, on Juliet's earlier point about uh, credit agencies, I think that will run and run. Alison, uh, at two o'clock on the dot, over to you. <laughs> okay, I just want to suggest to us that we have a strong look at what's happening in travel and tourism over the next short while, because that to me is a barometer of whether the public really has changed its mind, whether all these optimistic things about the different way that we're going to behave will actually come in reality. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a big argument, we talked on a little bit, Giles, a couple of weeks ago, but keep an eye on that because um, that will tell us whether we actually need sticks as well as carrots. Are you keeping an eye? Are we changing? Unfortunately, the travel industry is trying to make us dream again in spades and there's no government lead anywhere that I've seen saying, actually, do you know what? Maybe we need to put the brakes on travel and tourism. 20% of the global economy is quite enough, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as we're running over, uh, Spencer, I'd like to come back to you. Uh, you may have some other points that you want to make, but can you address... Um, the question of whether it is we are now at such a point that your sector and others need to act as the science demands um, rather, th um, rather than even uh, rather than factoring in as we have over past generations uh, 
um, being led by your fiduciary duty to, to shareholders, et cetera? I think you try and do both, Giles, but the reality is if you're trying to do something which is good, but which society is not yet caught up with, there will be a limit to how much you can do. Um, we all wish we had unlimited funding for the NHS, but we don't have unlimited funding for the NHS. Um, so, Spencer, people uh, would say that um, so far, far from not having caught up yet, society is way okay, ahead. Okay, so let me give you an example. So for uh, somebody very early on, I, I, uh, I think it was Chris, made the point that CCUS was unproven at scale. I 100% agree that it's unproven at scale. Why is it unproven at scale? Because we don't have a carbon price. What does CCUS do? It captures carbon. How do you incentivize people to capture carbon? By putting a price on the carbon, and then you'll, 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 you'll go about, um, then, then you'll find all sorts of uh, different ways of trying to capture carbon. So uh, will we see a massive, uh, scaling up a CCUS without a carbon price or other types of incentives, highly unlikely because all you'll do, everybody who makes that, does that, will go out of business. They just go, they just go bust because they're doing something at billions of dollars of cost and making no money whatsoever. And so you will need some sort of carbon price or some other types of thing to say, we value you taking carbon out of the world and we're going to therefore try and support that. And the idea that you will do that and you can do that on a repeated sustained basis until society in some way or other um, rewards that, I, I think is just, well, it just, you're, unless you've got enormous deep pockets or you're an enormous charity, it would be a very hard thing to do. Just a couple of other points. James, I 100% agree on carbon pricing. Yes, Dieter Helm and many others have written about the importance of carbon pricing. It is the, the, not, the, not the single solution to this problem, but it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the major way in which we do this. We don't like carbon, put a price on it. You put a price on it, you incentivize everybody to try and uh, reduce their carbon emissions. How much companies like BP produce, uh, in, in, uh, how, many, how much carbon consumers uh, uh, consume it and so on. In terms of the financial markets disciplining companies and the sustainability of their models, uh, the point that both Bruce and Juliet made, I 100% agree. I think this will become an enormously important issue going forward. The task force on um, uh, climate-related uh, exposures, TCFD, the task force which was started by Mark Carney, is the first step and an important step in terms of trying to increase the transparency associated with uh, climate related exposures of companies. BP has signed up to TCFD. We've signed up, one of our aims is to try and be a, a leader in, in, our, in our climate transparency. Again, hold us to account, we're not there yet, but hold us to account to see if we do that. Um, and, and, and I think that discipline from the financial markets, not just, not just rating agencies, but for investors more generally, will become an increasingly powerful force coming forward. Thank you very much, Spencer. We've, we've run over a little bit, but I hope you agree it's been worth it. In these conversations, uh, they're always frustrating. I admit, huge questions and uh, piecemeal answers, no overarching strategy. But I think we probably all agree that the short answer to the question, uh, COVID has received a moonshot, uh, treatment does climate change deserve it too is is yes but there are clearly huge obstacles hence quite a lot of pessimism about whether we're going to build back better or not uh, vested interests human inertia global leadership or lack of it um, but we've had some lessons from a small nation thank you jane and thank you for reminding us of the wonderful random kindnesses uh, that i hope we've all experienced uh, under lockdown um, the big question, and I'm not going to rabbit on, is uh, which I think remains unanswered, is whether the um, COVID experience, which has seen uh, such rapid and large-scale government action at a time when people had lost faith in government to do things quickly or bigly, whether they might, whether governments might have the the, the courage to uh, continue in that vein with the even bigger uh, looming uh, challenge of of climate change. And of course, if they're democratic, that depends on us. Uh, with that, I just want to thank uh, Spencer, Jane, and Juliet, and everybody. I haven't even come close to keeping up with the chat, but I shall read it with great interest. Thank you, Merapi. Thanks everyone for joining us and do come again. You can wave in a natural way. Bye-bye. <laughs>